Okay, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to come out here and share twice um, some work from my group. So I designed this very much that today's talk would be a little bit more of an introduction, tomorrow's would be a little bit more in-depth um, per the, the organizers, so I hope that works out. And I was really inspired by the title of the talk that's going to follow mine immediately about building a plasmonic sensor. And so I thought we'd get started today by building a plasmonic sensor in PowerPoint. Um, this is really easy to do. <laughs> So you just start off with your favorite plasmonic nanostructure. This can be a single nanoparticle, this can be an array of nanoparticles, this can be a nanoparticle aggregate, pretty much whatever your flavor of interest is. That's step one. Step two then is typically we're going to functionalize that nanoparticle with molecules. And so we can do this by either directly binding an analyte of interest to our nanostructure as shown schematically here. You can introduce some type of binding moiety on the surface. For example, you can take something like biotin, so you can functionalize your nanoparticle of interest with biotin, and then use that to capture a secondary probe, in this case using an anti-biotin antibody um, that's uh, attached to a gold nanostructure in this particular case. Or you can adsorb your molecule of interest, which is often what we do in SIRS, particularly when we're doing single molecule SIRS. And so here I've shown schematically a molecule just sitting very conveniently in a hot spot that's created at the junction between two nanostructures. And so once you've assembled your sensor, you then just have to detect some signal of interest. And this is typically something like looking at a shift in the plasmon resonance or looking at things like SIRS from your analyte of interest. Now, of course, this is in PowerPoint, so it's highly idealized. If you look at this first picture here, you'll notice that all of the molecules on the surface are organized beautifully, right? It's totally homogeneous. Everybody's pointing in the right direction. It's just lovely. If you look at the second example, you see you get quantitative binding. So every single biotin that's sitting on the surface manages to capture its target of interest. And then in this last example here with this uh, SIRS sing or single molecule SIRS, you have ideal analyte placement. Gosh darn it, that molecule just landed right in that hot spot. Everything is great. So this is the beauty of PowerPoint chemistry, right? I can make it work. But in reality, when we think about using plasmonics for sensing type applications, which is often where we're doing these things in biology, we have to ask questions like, where are the molecules actually binding to the surface? And more importantly, how does this impact the response? We saw some beautiful images this morning from George where he shows that you're going to have regions on the surface of nanostructures where you're going to have much more strongly enhanced fields, and that's going to impact the magnitude of the signal that you measure. Moreover, if you're going to attach a ligand to the surface that's going to target an analyte of interest, you want to know whether or not that function is actually retained on the surface. So you can attach as many antibodies as you want, but if they're all pointing the wrong way and unable to bind their antigen of interest, you've made a totally garbage sensor. Right? So all of these issues are really important, and the challenge that we face is that many of our characterization tools are simply ill-equipped to answer these questions. For example, we can do things like dynamic light scattering or measure zeta potentials, and this gives us a sense of successful functionalization of the surface, that we've at least impacted some chemistry, but it's at an ensemble level. So we're not able to see whether all of our sensors are performing at optimal levels or whether we're just simply measuring the signal from a select few that are performing optimally. We can then turn to single particle techniques, which can uncover some of that hidden heterogeneity, but things like electron microscopy and atomic force microscopy are often not sensitive to the ligands on the surface. Since these are typically going to be carbon-based, you're just not going to get very good contrast in electron microscopy, and then AFM, you have to really engineer your tip in order to get that kind of spatial resolution. So, Optics presents a really kind of intriguing opportunity for trying to overcome some of these limitations. And this is partially because we have an inherent signal coming from our plasmonic sensor where we can either measure the indirect response of the plasmon resonance down to the single particle level, or we can look at SIRS from our analyte of interest bound to the particles. Moreover, we can engineer an additional response by adding an extrinsic tag that can generate a fluorescent signal that we can measure. And most importantly, these techniques are going to be sensitive down to the single particle, single molecule level. So basically, everything is great. And so here's a little cartoon of how a typical optical microscopy experiment like, might look. 
you'll have some sort of laser excitation source or white light excitation source, pretty much whatever flavor you want. You'll direct it up through some high numerical aperture objective to your sample of interest. Here I'm showing a little gold nano rod. <laughs> That nano rod will generate some signal, again, either Rayleigh scattering at the plasmon resonance, uh, SIRS if you have some tag on the surface, fluorescence if you put some tag on the surface, and you'll collect that signal down through your objective and image it onto a CCD. So everything seems great. Until you run into this. Cartoon, I'm showing a rod, but on my microscope or on my camera, what I'm imaging is a diffraction limited spot. And we've already heard about this from Bjorn earlier today. We have this fundamental resolution limit that we run into when we're trying to do optical microscopy. And this is the diffraction limit of light. And so basically, whatever system I have, if it's smaller than roughly half the wavelength of light, I'm going to get this diffraction limited blob. And that means whether I'm looking at fluorescence from a single molecule, scattering from a single nanoparticle, if I have a single nanoparticle that I've labeled with many fluorescent molecules, or if I have a nanoparticle aggregate labeled with one molecule generating SIRS, if I didn't tell you what these were, you wouldn't know, right? This is a fundamental limit. And so what we do in my lab is we think about ways to overcome this diffraction limit of light and try to understand the function and performance of plasmonic sensors. And the good news is somebody has solved this problem. So if you, you know, pay attention to the Nobel Prize announcements, back in 2014, these three fellows were recognized for the development of what they call super-resolved fluorescence microscopy. And this essentially allows you to overcome this fundamental limit and start looking at things at the molecular level length scale. Now it turns out that super resolution imaging is a bit of an umbrella term that encompasses a huge variety of techniques, all of which have a goofy individual acronym. So some of these are based upon manipulating the excitation profile of your, of your source. And so this is uh, shown here, the basic operating principles of STED or stimulated emission depletion microscopy. Uh, another form called structured illumination microscopy will also manipulate the excitation source and allow you to excite with better than diffraction limited resolution. Then there's a huge series of these techniques, and again, there's just a bunch of goofy acronyms here that are based on the principle of single molecule localization. And then there are some people who believe that near field techniques are also um, falling under this umbrella of super resolution, although I happen not to be one of them, but that's a debate for another time. But what I'd like to focus on today is this, this whole suite of techniques based on single molecule localization. And it turns out the principles are all fundamentally the same across these different tools. So the first part is you have a diffraction limited emitter, which is going to have a width of roughly the wavelength of light. But what you can do is you can localize the source of that emission, oftentimes with precision better than 5 to 10 nanometers based on your signal to noise. So if I take this diffraction limited spot and I project it in three dimensions, you can see it has this kind of mountain-like shape which we can model to a model function, the simplest of which is a Gaussian. And so here I'm just showing you a two-dimensional Gaussian expression, which is the intensity across x and y is equal to some background, plus some term that has a peak intensity. This will represent the highest intensity at the center of the Gaussian. And then this exponential term, which contains s sub x and s sub y, which represent the width of your Gaussian in the x and y dimensions, and x naught and y naught, which represent the position of the peak of the Gaussian. So if you fit your experimental data to this function, the approximation we're going to make is that this x naught and y naught that we extract represents the position of my emitter. So now I'm able to localize my emission source to, again, better than often 5 or 10 nanometers. Now that's the first step. The problem is, if you have multiple emitters that are spaced by less than the diffraction limit, you're not going to be able to individually resolve each one. So here I'm just showing schematically a gold nano rod in which I've labeled it using double-stranded DNA with a whole bunch of fluorescent molecules represented as stars. And if I let all of those fluorescent molecules emit simultaneously, well, I just get a diffraction limited spot. And if I fit that to my two-dimensional Gaussian, all I extract is the average position of all of the emitters on the surface, which is not terribly informative. What I need to be able to do is to somehow turn off all of the emitters but one. If I can do that, so here I'm representing these as now dark emitters and only a single molecule remains on, 
my eye, it looks like a diffraction limited spot. So I don't really have any information until I fit it with this two-dimensional Gaussian and extract the center position, which should represent the position of my emitter. If I then allow that emitter to turn off and another to turn on, again by eye I have a diffraction limited spot, but when I fit it to my two-dimensional Gaussian and plot that x naught y naught position, it shows up in a new position. And if I repeat this for all of the molecules on the surface, I should be able to build up the structure of the underlying substrate and gain information about where those molecular labels are positioned on that substrate. So, Biology has been doing this with great success now for the past probably five to 10 years. Here's an example from Marcus Sauer's group, and I apologize that his name got cut off here. But these are just two examples where in the first on the left, I'm showing um, cytoskeletal features. So you have microtubules, which are shown in green, and then actin filaments shown in pink. And in the convention, conventional diffraction limited image, eh, you can sort of make out the microtubules, but the actin is pretty much hidden. Whereas if you do a super resolution type image based upon this idea of localizing individual molecules that are switching on and off with time, you can actually get much better resolution of the features. This is even more dramatic in these examples of a nuclear pore complex in cells where the diffraction limited image basically shows just a smear of light. But the super resolution image is able to resolve these very small circular features within individual cells. So clearly you're able to get very high resolution in biological systems. One question that often comes up is, how do you actually turn these molecules on and off? And it turns out that this is the whole origin of these crazy acronyms I alluded to earlier. So the folks who do things like STORM or POM use photo-switchable dyes. For example, STORM is based on these cyanine dyes where you can use different colors of laser excitation to toggle it between a fluorescent and a dark form. There's also diffusion-based techniques. These are known by the acronym PAINT, and if you really want to test me, you can ask me what all of these acronyms stand for later. Um, the basic idea here is you're going to have molecules that are diffusing in solution, and they're either non-fluorescent or they're diffusing so fast that you can't really see emission from a single molecule. It just gets smeared out. But then when that molecule binds to the surface of something, say a cell in this really crudely drawn picture, that molecule suddenly becomes emissive. Now you can localize its position. Alternatively, you have techniques like GSDIM, the worst acronym ever, also known as DSTORM. This is based upon triplet state shelving of your dye, where you essentially take advantage of the natural photophysics of the molecules such that instead of just going through these multiple ground to excited state transitions as shown under traditional fluorescence, you force most of the molecules to intersystem cross into a dark triplet state and then basically hold them there for some period of time. And if you can drive most of the molecules into this dark triplet state, they'll remain off and then you'll just wait for molecules to stochastically relax back to the on state where you can then collect fluorescent photons and localize the emission. There's also strategies based on using either electrochemical or redox switching. So there's a whole host of ways to do this. But what I'd really like to do in the last few minutes of my talk is to think about how we can take these ideas that have been beautifully developed in biology and biophysics and start applying them to concepts in plasmonics. So we got interested in this uh, about, gosh, five or six years ago now, as you can see from this citation maybe not, um, where we basically said, okay, we know a really great blinky source, and that is single molecule SIRS. If you go in the single molecule SIRS literature, it's basically hallmarked by this idea that you get SIRS signals that blink on and off with time. And we said, aha, okay, we can exploit that fact that these kind of signals are changing with time to localize the origin of the signal and see if we can gain insight into what's going on in a single molecule SIRS hotspot. So what we did is we simply took silver nanoparticle aggregates, these are some representative structures shown here, and we incubated them in solutions containing a SERS reporter dye, in this case this is rhodamine 6G, and again if we take this whole sample, our labeled nanoparticles, and we drop cast them onto a slide and we put them in our optical microscope like I showed earlier, we're just going to get this diffraction limited blob. But now we're going to take advantage of the fact that the signals are changing with time, which we speculated was due to the single molecule diffusing on the surface of the aggregate. 
So here's an example of the intensity time trace. We saw one of these earlier from Bjorn, where we're just looking at the intensity of the SERS as a function of time. And we see we get these really strong fluctuations over time, and then eventually it just drops off in a single digital step. This is most likely either photo bleaching or some just destruction of the molecule, similar to what George talked about earlier. For each one of these points, we're going to calculate the associated X naught and Y naught that we extract by fitting that two-dimensional Gaussian, and that's going to give us the scatter plot shown here. So each one of these points in the scatter plot represents the spatial origin of a given um, diffraction-limited emission spot. If I look at this as a function of time, so this is actually a diffusion trajectory, so I have the x value, the y value, this is the time axis here, and then the color scale represents the intensity, you can see that this scatter plot is actually representing points that are moving over time. So the center position that we calculate actually shifts with time, and there's a relationship between the position of where that center position lands and the intensity of the signal that we measure. We can see this a little more effectively if we plot this as what we call a spatial intensity map. So what I'm showing here is essentially a histogram of the scatter plot in this upper uh, right corner, where now what I'm doing is in, within each bin of this two-dimensional histogram, I'm calculating the average SERS intensity that we measure. And we found something really interesting, which is that when our emission originated from sites in the upper right corner of this histogram, we had much stronger overall SERS intensity than when our emission originated from regions in the lower left version or region. And you can see that the intensity decays in this gradient directional fashion away from the region of strongest overall SERS. Now, if you go into the literature and you look up calculations from people like George Schatz, what you find is that they often predict if you have an aggregated nanostructure, you have a region of very strong enhancement in the gap between two nanostructures, and then that enhanced electromagnetic field decays in a directional gradient fashion away from that gap. And this is exactly what we were measuring experimentally. Here's a few more examples of these spatial intensity histograms, or again, we have regions of high intensity that decay in a gradient directional fashion to lower intensity. To probe this, we started doing correlated optical and structural imaging. So just like we heard from Bjorn and from Jennifer, where we can now take our optical measurements and do correlated electron microscopy to see how they agree. Here I'm showing another example of one of these SERS spatial intensity maps, where again we have a region of very strong SERS intensity and then a gradient directional decay in the intensity away from that spot. In this case, the associated structure was this uh, nice dimer shown here. And again, if we think about theory, theory predicts we would get the strongest intensity in this junction and then the SERS intensity would decay away from that junction. And so if we resize our spatial intensity map and just qualitatively put it right on top of my structure, we actually find we get really nice agreement between the orientation of the high intensity edge of our spatial intensity map and the geometry of this junction, and we find that this decay tracks with moving away from that junction. And this type of behavior is very reproducible. Here I'm showing two examples that are trimers, where especially if we look at the one on the right, we have this very nice high intensity edge and gradient directional decay that really beautifully follows one of the junctions within the, the trimer and wouldn't agree spatially with the other junction in the trimer. So we think we have good evidence that these super resolution techniques, which again have been very powerful in biology, have applicability in plasmonics. Turns out we're not the only folks who have this idea. So a few months after our paper appeared, there was this lovely paper from Zhang Zhang's group. Again, I apologize, the reference is being cut off. And he used a really different strategy, this idea of paint, where you're now taking advantage of a diffusing molecule. So what he did is he had these hot spots, which are represented here in green, and he had diffusing dye in solution that was diffusing so fast you really didn't get enough background from it. But when it managed to diffuse into the hot spot, you would see this very strong burst of fluorescence that the, then he could fit to this two-dimensional Gaussian and localize. And so he did this experiment for a few different samples. First, he just used an aluminum island film, so he just deposited aluminum on a substrate, 
And what he found was he would get regions where you would see these very, very strong fluorescence intensities confined within a roughly you know, 20 to 50 nanometer region in space. He then also looked at things like silver nanoparticle clusters, similar to the work that we did, and basically found the identical behavior that I just showed you. This idea that you had a region where you had very strong intensity, and then it decayed in a gradient directional fashion and extended over many tens of nanometers. So this was very much consistent with the work that we'd shown. Now the two examples I've given you so far involve what we call hot spots or junctions between adjacent particles. Let's move on to another system such as the gold nanowire shown here. So we can take this gold nanowire and we can functionalize it with a dye labeled ligand. In this case, this is our work. So we use double-stranded DNA with a thiol on one end that would allow it to bind the gold. And then a reporter molecule, Tamra, down to the other end that's going to behave like a fluorophore. And again, if I allow myself to do some PowerPoint chemistry, I get the structure shown here. Although I'll point out this is not even close to scale. So the idea is the double-stranded DNA will of course stand up perfectly straight away from the surface. The dye molecules will be used to report on their individual positions. And I'll just take this. And in this case, the switching mechanism I'm going to use is this triplet state mediated photo switching I described earlier, where we'll work in an oxygen free environment and use a high laser intensity to drive as many of the molecules into this triplet state as possible. And here's the data. So what I'm showing here is again a scatter plot where each one of these points represents an individual molecular emission event that we were able to localize with our two dimensional Gaussian. Here's the corresponding SEM showing that things look pretty good. Here's a histogram just showing the frequency with which we localize events to a particular region. And you can see that we have activity along the entire length of the Dana wire. And then here's another spatial intensity map where now I'm showing the average fluorescence intensity that we measure along the length of the nanowire. And if I just recontrast that SEM and put my spatial intensity map on top of it, I'm, we get the answer. It's awesome, right? So, nailed it. Turns out we see some really interesting behavior, however. So on the bottom here, I'm showing three more frequency histograms associated with different nanowires, where in some cases, we see significantly more activity at the ends of the nanowire than along the middle of the nanowire. And in some cases, we almost see clustering of events at very discrete locations along the nanowire axis. So again, we go into the SEM, we do these correlated measurements, and what we find, for example, in this case where we had very localized emission events, is we had little nanoparticle defects, just crud that was on the surface. And if you just take a spatial intensity map and you lie it right on top, I'll sort of put it and take it away just so you can see it, <laughs> they appear to be co-localized with these defects on the surface. So in this case, super resolution imaging tells us we have two possibilities. Either the DNA is only binding to these defect sites, which I think is less likely, or the molecular emission is actually coupling to propagating plasmon modes within this nanowire. And then as that plasmon propagates, when it gets to defect sites, it has a higher probability of radiating, and therefore we localize the emission at that site. Now it turns out there's some other folks working in this similar arena. So here's another example. This is from the UGE and coworkers. And what they did in this case is they took a photo switchable protein. So this is a, a green fluorescent protein variant that you can switch on and off. And they attached it to silver nanowires that were 200 nanometers in diameter. And so here's the traditional diffraction limited image. And here's the reconstructed image. And the answer is they look pretty much the same they certainly are not getting the right diameter of the nanowires. They then went and did a second experiment. In this case, they took again these silver nanowires. In this case, they functionalized it with an antibody and then a secondary antibody that carried an Alexa dye that could be photo switched between this uh, non-fluorescent and fluorescent state. They excited the nanowire just at the end and then they looked at the emission along the length of the nanowire. And they again saw some really weird behavior where they would sometimes see, oh, I put the wrong one in here. So they would see that molecules, it looked like there were two molecules, but they were blinking together, which statistically didn't make sense. So if you go through their data and you actually look at some of their reconstructed images, what they found was that in some cases, if a nanowire was thin enough, you would get a reconstructed image that actually agreed very well with the true dimensions of the nanowire, 
Whereas in other cases where you had a really thick nanowire, you would get this splitting where it effectively was much larger than it should have been. So this is what the true size of the nanowire is. And this is effectively a histogram representing where they saw the emission localized. And they think what's happening is as the molecule emits, it's interacting with this plasmonic nanostructure. And that plasmonic nanostructure is distorting the emission so that you're not getting a point that represents where the molecule is sitting, but instead a convolution with the structure of the nanowire. All right, so this brings me to my conclusion slide. Um, I've shown you a little bit about super resolution imaging and how it allows us to defeat the diffraction limiting limit of light by taking advantage of our ability to localize single molecules, but using photo switchable molecules so we can localize different molecules at a time and then build up a composite image. I've shown some good examples where we have this great idea of plasmon coupled emission um, from molecules located in hot spots. But we also have some tricks or some bad things here. And it's this idea that as our molecules are interacting with plasmonic nanostructures, we can have significant distortion in where the emission is localized. And so unlike in biophysics and traditional biological experiments where things seem to reconstruct accurately, we get these really interesting reconstructed images that don't reflect the true structure of the underlying substrate. And tomorrow I'll talk about a few examples of this in greater detail, but for today I'll acknowledge the folks that did the work, the folks who pay the bills, and you for your attention.